So um, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, come and talk to you today. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm, <clears throat> I'm somewhat honoured to be here also, but uh, a little surprised, because quite frankly, my last couple of presentations haven't gone terribly well. So I, I just want to kind of manage your expectations. In terms of this. I, I spoke um, uh, 10 days ago in... in uh, Copenhagen. And for those of you who don't know, I'm, I'm actually from the northeast of England. So how, how many of you, English is your second language? Wow. So it's the same for me. I'm from Newcastle. So, <laughs> <coughs> so it, in, English, is, English is my second language. Unfortunately, I've discovered most of you tend to speak it better than I do. But anyway, so I'm in uh, Copenhagen and I'm speaking at a conference. <coughs> And um, a lot of people there from, from Norway, obviously, next door. And I'm trying to make the Norwegians feel at ease by saying, you know, you Norwegians and us folk from Newcastle have a lot in common. And it goes back to 970 AD, when you Norwegians spent a lot of time on the northeast coast, stealing our cattle <laughs> and our women and our sheep, which just proved to me that they speak English perfectly but have absolutely no sense of humour. <laughs> um, but that was, that was nothing. I, I missed the introduction. Was, was it good? Do I sound really good in the introduction? Yeah. Good, excellent. So um, <clears throat> the amount of told you about Metro Bank, the thing everybody knows about Metro Bank is we're famous for we allow dogs to come into our bank. And we have dog bowls, we have dog biscuits. And I was, and you couldn't make this up, I was addressing the Inner Mongolian Financial Leaders Group. There were 29 of them. Between them, they spoke one word of English. And they were in Metro Bank, so I was trying to talk to them through a translator, not very easy. <clears throat> and I'm showing them around, I'm very proud of the bank. I'm going, here in Metro Bank, we love dogs. Just not the way you do in Mongolia. <laughs> So um, what I want to do over the next 30 minutes or so is, is three things. I want to tell you a little bit about Metro Bank. Um, I want to talk about the philosophy, and I want to talk about how it's delivered. But I know a, a number of you, I suspect, are or wish to be entrepreneurs. So who wants to start their own business? Yeah, quite, quite a lot of you. So what I want to do is just before I go through those three things, is just tell you a couple of the challenges that we had in creating what was the first new bank in the UK for over a hundred uh, for over a hundred years. So just to give you a sense of, of some of the challenges that we faced. <clears throat> um, so could we get regulatory approval? Could we get authorised? I know that you had Andrew Bailey speak on Friday, who, who I have a great deal of respect for. Getting approval for a new bank was very, very difficult. Um, I say it was almost Kafka-esque. So at one point in the process of approval, we were told by the regulator that we couldn't be approved, we couldn't get a bank license until such times as we could prove to them that our IT platform worked on the external payment system. Okay? So it can't be authorised until we prove that our IT system works on the external payment system. However, you can't go on to the external payment system until you're authorised. <laughs> and we had this six-month circular conversation. So reg getting regulatory approval was very, very difficult, very time-consuming, and therefore very costly. The second challenge was um, around IT and infrastructure. So whether you build a bank for one person or a million customers, you need to have the same very robust, very secure uh, infrastructure. And it's very expensive. In America, where there's about 7,200 banks and about 200 new banks every year, there's a very active system in <coughs> providing very simple, rentable banking solutions. This just didn't exist in the UK. We had to build out a solution whilst we were waiting to be regulated. And it cost us about £8 million before we were even regulated, we'd spent this money. And if the bank hadn't regulated us, the Bank of England and the FSA, 
that money would have just been completely wasted. Um, <clears throat> the third challenge was raising capital. So raising money for new business. We, we ultimately raised about just over a quarter of a billion, 253 million pounds for Metro Bank. But raising the first bit, the first 75 million pounds, was incredibly difficult. And uh, you just do these series of roadshows presenting your business case to um, hedge funds, private equity, venture capital, private offices, family offices, all sorts of things. Just day in, day out. And you try and do them all in a, r a relatively short period of time, like 10 days or so. So we did 10 days in the UK, no interest. Nobody thought there was an opportunity for a new bank. We could not get one pound of raised equity in the UK. So we actually raised all the money in America. In a two-week period in 2008, between um, so around about the last week of August, first week of September, and it's just presentation, presentation, presentation. Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, Connecticut, Boston. But you're kind of backwards and forwards, just meeting, 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 10 meetings a day. Uh, and finally, on Friday the uh, 8th of September, we had commitments. Were you at the ball last night? Yeah? No? Problems with buses? Yeah, nothing to do with the ball. Okay. So... Um, Friday the 8th of September, we have commitments to $116 million, right? So first time the bank feels real, we've got commitments <coughs> to $116 million. Um, I flew home on the Friday night, overnight, got free upgrade from BA, very unusual. So I had a glass of champagne on the plane, went home, told my wife Saturday morning, we've raised all the money, she went out to spend it. Um, <laughs> And then on the Monday, Lehman Brothers went bust. And of the $116 million we had committed uh, on the Friday, 56 million of it disappeared on the Monday. So, um, and a number of the companies actually had disappeared by the Monday. So raising money was incredibly difficult. Um, though the issues around the economics of the physicality, Metro is very much a physical branch-based bank. We call them stores, and I'll explain why in a minute. So could we find physical locations that fitted our economic model? Because we think of ourselves as a retailer, not as a bank. So we're competing with other retailers for properties. And we want the best property, which is uh, generally the most expensive. And the final challenge, of course, is could we persuade people to switch? You know, people in the UK <coughs> traditionally don't switch banks. So that was the final challenge. Could we persuade enough people to switch uh, to Metrobank? So let me just tell you a little bit about us. So first new bank for over 100, 100 years. Uh, we're 50% retail and 50% commercial. So commercial is generally SMEs I in our case. Because the size of commercial business you can handle is a function of the size of your balance sheet. So our, when we opened our doors, we had very little by way of deposits, just shareholder money. We could make loans of maybe a million pounds. Now that the balance sheet's closer to a billion, we can make loans of 10 or 15 million. So about half of it's commercial, half of it's retail. We think of ourselves as a retailer. And retailers, the great retailers, are single-minded in their pursuit of what is it that customers want. And what customers want in terms of banking is primarily two things, if you leave aside the hygiene factors like safety. It's around service and it's around convenience. So we open seven days a week. We open from 8 in the morning until 8 at night, Monday to Friday, 8 till 6 on Saturday, and 11 till 5 on Sunday. Funnily enough, those are the hours people want to bank. People want to bank on their way to work in the morning. They want to work bank on their way home in the evenings or at weekends. People don't want to bank between 9 and 5 because that's when they're at work. And interestingly, we open more accounts outside of traditional banking hours, i.e. after 4, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, on Saturdays and Sundays, than we open in normal, normal, opening, uh, normal bank opening hours. I'm going to talk a lot about the physicality of it because physical locations are important. They're important to us for two reasons. One is that 9 out of 10 accounts 
are opened in a physical location. So when we opened our bank on the uh, 29th of July 2010, we had no customers. So we are in the customer acquisition business. So we want to be open. We want to open accounts when people want to open them. <coughs> Physicality is very important. But we also have telephony, we have internet, and we have uh, mobile banking. So if we're in the business of account opening, we want to make that really easy for people. So we will open you your account uh, within 15 minutes. You don't need to make an appointment. You just walk in. We'll open your account within 15 minutes. Within that 15 minutes, we will give you your chip and pin, debit card, and credit card. Yeah? This, this is my bank card. Actually, this is my bank card. <laughs> and uh, we'll also give you, within 15 minutes, a printed checkbook with your name on it. So what's the biggest problem when you get your debit card through the post from your bank? You haven't got a pin number. You haven't got a pin number, exactly. We give you a machine, you put your card in, you set your pin there and then. So you walk past, you thought, well, maybe I'll open an account. 15 minutes later, you have this in your hand. You don't believe it works. So what we used to find is, it's, this is really quite an interesting age thing. All the people sort of over 40 and older, people like me, would take this, they would walk out of the store, across the road to Sainsbury's and put it in the Sainsbury's machine to check if it worked because they didn't want to look really rude by putting it into our machine in the bank. Whereas all you young people don't care. You just walk up, put it in, oh yeah, it works, great. <laughs> uh, we've got, just to give you a little bit of background, 16 stores open today. We think we can open about 220 of them broadly within the M25. Not exactly, but you know, near enough. Um, that's... The one on the left is you see Snack West. Right is Metro Bank. This is, um, I think this, this one is Hounslow. And you will see that everybody's going to Metro Bank and nobody's going to Snack West. <laughs> and the reason for this is because I took the photo at 10 to 9 in the morning when we were open but Snack West hadn't opened. So uh, you can see, you just get a sense of the, the, the kind of the location of it. <coughs> So what makes us different? We have a very simple philosophy of life. And our philosophy of life is this, that what matters more to people, what matters more to customers, what matters most to customers, rather, is value. It's not about price. Now, the UK high street banks would have you believe that the most important thing to customers is price. So when you walk along the high street, you see a poster, and it says we'll give you 4% on your current account. You go, wow, that's good. And then you read the small print. It says 4% on the first £1,000 for the first six months, and you've got to transfer your salary to us, and you've got to give us your firstborn. <laughs> right, it doesn't actually say last one. I'm just checking if you're listening. <laughs> but the whole point is, they think it's all about price, so they offer a high price and then try and drive it down. What matters to people, and I suggest what matters to you, is not price. Price is not the key determinant in life. What matters to you is value. And value is an amalgam of many different things. We think in banking it's about service, it's about convenience, it's about transparency, it's about being able to see the relationship and the costs of banking. Um, it's about consistency. It's about treating your existing customers as well as you treat new customers. I think it's outrageous that businesses treat new customers, give better deals to new customers than they give to their existing customers. And you walk in and you go, well, why can't I have this? Go, because you're a customer. We've got you, sucker. <laughs> so for us, it's all about what is value. And service and convenience are two of the most key elements of that. But putting the customer at the centre of everything that we do and absolutely passionately believing in that is fundamental to what we do. And we're about three things. And really, this is all I'm going to talk about for the next ten minutes or so. Three things. It's about creating a differentiated model. So when all of the other banks think it's about price, we say it's about value, it's about service, it's about convenience, it's about transparency, all those things I mentioned. 
It's about then creating a culture that underpins and reinforces that differentiated model. And then it's about relentless execution. And we talk about creating fans, not customers. That might sound like an odd thing to say in banking, but we genuinely believe it is possible to create fans. And I'll tell you how we go about doing it. I've just talked about that one. So, as I say, we think of ourselves as a retailer, not as a banker. Every bank, high street bank you go into in the UK today, the person who greets you, the person behind the counter, the person behind the desk, has a sales target. And anywhere between, depending on the bank, between a quarter and a third of their income is derived from hitting that sales target. Yeah. And if they don't hit those sales targets, they will be penalised. Now, call me old-fashioned, but if you set people's sales targets, you incentivize them to sell things, you reward them for selling things, and you penalize them for not selling things, I think there's a fair chance they're going to try and sell you something. And that's why the UK banks get 5,000 complaints every day. And they're only open Monday to Friday. <laughs> Imagine if they're open seven days like us. Every person you meet when you walk into a metro bank has one target and one target only, which is a customer satisfaction target. They have no financial rewards for selling you anything. So I don't believe you can claim to be customer-centric if you then reward your people for selling things. That is not in the customer's best interests. There is an incongruence there. Culture is really, really important to us because the culture has to underpin everything that you do. And in a service business like banking, service is delivered by people. So it's very important to us that this culture that we deliver, <coughs> excuse me, underpins our model. And I see a lot of businesses where this isn't the case. So the one I see most commonly is businesses who say, we want to enter into a dialogue with our customers. We want to, have en we want to engage our customers. We want to use social media to do that, to create this dialogue to understand what our customers are thinking. Then they won't allow their staff to use social media devices at work. So they say one thing and they do something very different. So Metrobank, we say we're all about service. Therefore, if you come to join us, you have to be as passionate about service as we are. We don't want fence sitters. We don't want people who say, well, I'll try it, see if it's for me. You're either in or you're out. And if you join us and we find that you are not committed to service, to, to serving customers, you will not last very long. Um, we interviewed three and a half thousand people for the first 60 customer facing roles. Okay? Your economic strategies, so you can work out the average there. Anybody who can't? <laughs> three and a half thousand, 60. Yeah? We're okay. Um, we were looking for one thing in particular from these first 65 people, or from the 3,500 interviewees. One thing, and I'd like you to have a guess what that was. This is the interactive bit. Have a guess, go on. Who said that? Exactly right. Normally it takes us a while to get to that. You know, it's people who want to give great service, blah, blah, blah. Smile is absolutely right. Because if you're not going to smile in your first job interview, when are you going to smile? And we've all been into businesses where the person behind the counter clearly regards you as an unwarranted intrusion on their day. <laughs> well, we don't want that. We want people who want to give great service. So we talk about recruit for attitude and train for skills. Training people to deliver banking services isn't difficult. What you can't do is train them to want to give great service. They're either committed to it or they, or they don't. Um, I asked my PA to put a picture in this slide. I would just like to make a point. I'm, a, I'm not misogynist. 
B, you don't have to be blonde to work in Metro Bank, and, <laughs> and you don't have to lie on the floor. It was, this was entirely of their volition, uh, nothing, nothing to do with us. Oh, nothing to do with me, anyway. So, um, the hardest thing, the hardest thing was empowering people to give great service. So, welcome everyone. Welcome to your first day at Metro Bank. You're all empowered to give great customer service. Do you have any idea what I mean? Because I'm not sure I do. What does empowerment mean? Let me give you two, two examples. Um, one good and uh, one not so good. So, first one was, um, I was in our store one Sunday morning. We, we hadn't been open very long. We were really fortunate we had queues of people uh, to open accounts. So people having to wait. Although we could open accounts in 15 minutes, people having to wait maybe an hour to open an account. And a, a guy came up to me. He said, you see this young lady I'm sitting with? I said, yeah. He said, um, she just mentioned in passing that she's been waiting uh, for over an hour. She's got eight pounds worth of parking fees. A car's in a, an NCP car park. I went, okay, what do you want to do? He said, um, I'd like to give her something. I said, great, what do you want to give her? He went, I'd like to give her four pounds. I said, fantastic. Let's just half piss her off. <laughs> because to, uh, in banking, the difference between four and eight pounds in the lifetime value of the customer is just a rounding error. You know, it's just neither here nor there. But to this guy, four pounds might be a third or a quarter of what he spends going out on a Friday night. You know, tellers earn about 19 grand gross before, before they pay tax on that. So, you know, they don't earn a lot of money. So, empowerment is relative, you know, it's relative to him. Four pounds to him was a lot of money, whereas to us in the bank it wasn't a lot of money. Um, you can just see, and I'll, I'll show you a photo later, in the corner of this picture is something called a um, magic money machine. It's a coin counting machine. Um, what you find is, and this is not terribly scientific, but I will, I'll bet I'm pretty much going to be accurate. Most of the men in this room have a jar of coins or some receptacle of coins. Yeah? How many? Yeah, most of the men. Women make change. It's not a sexist remark, it just happens to be true. You know, men store coins, women make change, generally. And um, what these coin counting machines do is you take your coins, the men's jars of coins, you pour them in, and they count them, and they give you a receipt, and you take that to the counter, they either put that into your account in notes, or they'll give it to you, put, sorry, put it into your account, or give it to your notes. You go into another high street bank, they insist that you bag them up in exactly the right amount, so 102 pence pieces or 101 pence pieces or whatever. And if they're not the right amount, they won't take them. And then when they do take them, they charge you between 9 and 11% for the privilege of taking your money. Well, these machines do it free. Uh, and they're great machines. Unfortunately, occasionally they break down. And the biggest cause of them breaking down is foreign objects in the coin jars i.e. things that are not coins. Uh, th these machines are American. The biggest problem with in America, in America breaking down is bullets. <laughs> Why men keep bullets in their coin jars, I do not know. <laughs> we haven't had this problem, I'm pleased to say, in the UK. <laughs> but we've yet to open in Brixton. Um, <laughs> oh yes, yeah, I've forgotten. So, uh, in Cromwell Road, a woman walks in with a young girl in a guide's outfit carrying a jar of coins almost as big as she is. Fair chance she's going to use the coin machine. The coin machine has broken down. So, um, my colleague in the store sees the girl, sees the mum, says, look, I'm sorry the machine's broken down. Can I, we have another store about a mile away, Fulham Broadway. Can I get you a taxi to take you and your daughter to Fulham Broadway? So, flags down taxi, 
girl goes, uh, mum and the girl go in the taxi. Um, she, my colleague calls the store. Somebody comes out, pays for the taxi. Girl goes in, uses the coin machine, give her a couple of lollipops. Everybody's happy. Now that's great. You can't teach people that kind of empowerment. Now, she got a cab, fantastic. Maybe the next time somebody will book a mer chauffeur-driven Mercedes you know, or a helicopter <laughs> might be going a bit too far. But my problem at the moment is getting people to go far enough in terms of being empowered to give great customer service. We reward our people for giving great customer service, as I say, and we measure what matters. So we measure customer satisfaction. We mystery shop every store every other day with a professional firm to find out what the quality of our service is like. We have customers who have volunteered to do the same thing for us. We don't pay them. They have just volunteered to actually go out and give us feedback on the service that they receive. Um, we measure complaints and we measure customer advocacy through something called Net Promoter Score. Is some of you familiar with that? A couple. So Net Promoter Score was uh, invented by a guy called Frederick Reichel. A great book on it. And it basically says this. You ask customers to score you 1 to 10. 1 being absolutely terrible, 10 being absolutely brilliant. You ignore 7s and 8s as being passives. You regard 1 to 6 as negative, And 9 and 10s as positive. And you subtract the negatives from the positive to get your net promoter score. There are banks in the UK that have negative net promoter scores. And uh, this is what we get. This is a form filled in by a customer. It's actually a very good form filled in by a customer. We get bad ones, but I wasn't going to put one of those up. This is, a, this is quite a nice one. Everything that's in red was from the customer. So Keith exceeds expectations. How would you rate our service? You were excellent. Yes, exclamation mark. How can we improve our service to you? You can't, scored. Um, would you recommend Metro Bank to your friends and family? Definitely underlined three times and exclamation mark. Now, I would suggest to you, I would suggest to you that this person is probably a fan. Not everybody is, I admit that, but I do believe that you can actually create fans of banks by giving them great service. Who's heard the um, American Indian expression, to first know a man well, you must walk a mile in his shoes? Some of you heard this? Yeah, a few of you have heard this. I thought this is great. What a great expression. Because by the time he realises you've got his shoes, you're a mile away. But, but apparently that, that's, not, that's not the purpose of it. It's to first know somebody well, you've got to get inside their skin. You've got to really understand them. And what I used to do when I was at the bank was every, I get, I get a coffee every morning at 10 o'clock, Starbucks. And I would either sit in the store and just listen to my colleagues and listen to customers. Or I'd go and sit in the contact centre and put on a pair of headphones and listen to the conversations of real life people. And I remember listening to one and a woman rang up you went through the security procedures and she said, how much is in my account? And my colleague on the phone said, £25. Went, okay. She said, um, I paid in a cheque for £15. Has that cleared yet? She went, no, I'm sorry, it hasn't. It won't clear until Monday. Oh, so my colleague said, is that a problem? She said, yeah, I need £27 to get me through till Friday. Now, that's the those are the lives of real people. I, mean, I sometimes forget that. You know, I'm in a fortunate position that if I need 27 quid to get to Friday, I'm all right. A lot of people aren't. And you've got to really understand what the lives of your customers are like. And I've seen far too many people who use market research as a proxy to save them actually having to go out on a wet, rainy Tuesday night and listen to their customers. But what's really important to me is just understanding what is important uh, to our customers and then re executing it relentlessly every day. Because when I first saw this, this bank model in America um, back in 2000, I thought it was fantastic. A bank that's loved by its customers, has fantastic customer advocacy scores, loved by its shareholders. You know, what's the secret sauce? 
What's the silver bullet? What's the one thing that makes this so brilliant? Of course, it isn't one thing. It's a hundred things, a thousand things, just done that bit better. When we opened the doors, we, uh, we said, we're not going to have any stupid bank rules. And within three months, we had some. So we, we came up with this idea that if anybody could find a stupid bank rule, we would kill the bank rule and we would give them, whether it was a customer or whether it was a colleague, £10. And it's amazing, you know, it, within three months we had them. We had, to, we had to try and get rid of them. This thing about dogs is, is it was fascinating. I was asked on the day that we opened <coughs> by a journalist, in all seriousness, she said, so is your point of differentiation that you have dog bowls and dog biscuits? I said, yeah, I, I admit you've seen through me. You know, these, these 50 pence dog bowls, this pounds worth of dog biscuits, nobody could copy that, could they? Well, of course it's not the point of differentiation. But what it seems to say to people is, if you can bring your dog into our bank, and we don't mind if he pees on the floor, or worse, which dogs do, then maybe we care more about you as a customer than we care about us as a bank. For those of you who are thinking of starting a business, this next slide's great. Isn't it fantastic to go into a market where 75% of the current accounts are held in, the, in four banks whose customers universally dislike them? <laughs> I mean, this is just great. I, and I admit this is a year old. I'm sure it's got better, but seven out of ten Santander customers hated them. So yeah, what a great market to come into. Through the, the methods I showed you, 9 out of 10, 94% of our customers say they are satisfied or very satisfied with the service that we give them. And 84%, sorry, 93%, wasn't it? I think it's 93%, not 94. 84%, 8 out of 10, would recommend us to a friend. Now, that's absolutely critical because we are in the business of attracting customers. And about half of the customers who join Metro Bank every week, it's about 3,000 customers, Half of them come in because they're referred by a friend. So that's incredibly important to us. Now the question I usually get asked at this point, and you'll be glad to hear I'm, I'm nearly at the end, um, is it's great, sounds great, great customer service, long opening hours, passionate about what you do, nice locations, can you make any money out of it? Well it's early days, you know, Metro Bank's just coming up to three years old. It was based on an American model, and the American model from 1990 to 2000 grew modestly, it was a small local bank in America. Then in about 2000, two things happened, it adopted this model and it went into Greater New York. And you can see its assets grew from 8.5 billion to 45 billion dollars, and its market cap went up uh, almost six times. And if you look at the value, of sh the share price, $10,000 worth of stock in 73 is worth $4.5 million by 2007. You can make money out of giving great customer service. But there is one point I really want to stress, and it's probably of everything I've said, it, for me it's the most important thing and the one I care about most of all, which is that profit is a byproduct of doing something well for the customer. It's not the reason for being in business. I know a number of very successful entrepreneurs. They've all gone into business because they had the idea for a better product or a better service or a better experience for customers. The profit is a byproduct of doing it well. One of the things I believe absolutely is one of the great malaise <coughs> in UK PLC today generally and the banks in particular, is people have forgotten this. They just think that they are in business to make money. Not that profit is a byproduct of doing that well. And the final thought I want to leave you with is not original, not, not really that any of this has been original, but it's something that I, I spoke on a platform, I don't know, uh, a year ago, maybe longer. <coughs> I followed a guy called Eric Wenemeyer. Has anybody heard of Eric Wenemeyer? 
really interesting guy. He he's about 30. He climbed Everest. It's quite a rare thing to do. Uh, but he's completely blind. He's the first blind person ever to climb, climb Everest. And he's a very accomplished climber. And he said something which really stuck with me, and I'll just leave you with this particular thought. He said that there is an expression, seeing is believing. Yeah? Seeing is believing. He said that's entirely wrong. He said what it is is believing is seeing. He says, because if you really, really passionately believe in something, you will see what it looks like. We're passionate about Metro Bank. We think we can grow it one customer, one colleague, one store at a time. And that way we can create fans, not customers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shanti. Thank you very much, Shanti, for that. We've only got time for one question, I'm afraid, though. So, two, okay, two very quick ones, very brief. Uh, there's, yeah, one down here, and then we'll go to the lady towards the back. Hi, um, thank you for your speech. Um, I'm interested to know that um, for a band to be successful or um, to perform well in the long run, uh, you need to have a, a huge pool of human capital um, to work for you. Like, how could you um, attract those financial professionals to work for you at the um, beginning of, of the stage of this business? It was difficult. We, um, so I would come to somebody like you and say, you're a very talented guy. I want you to come and be our head of compliance or head of credit or whatever. Um, we haven't been authorised by the uh, Bank of England yet, but we may never get authorised by the Bank of England. But I'd like you to come and join us and maybe in a year's time there won't be a job for you. Not a great you know, sort of job offer. It was amazing how many people would accept that. People were passionate, they really bought into the vision. People don't work for money. They work for satisfaction, they work because of the, the peer group that they work with. It's a whole bunch of other things. Money's not the key determinant. And we were just very fortunate people, a lot of people shared and bought into that vision. And uh, interesting, now I've stepped down from the bank, there are people there who are more passionate about it than I am. Thank you. So there's a lady in the blue sweater at the back, towards the back. Um, hi, thank you for your speech. It was really Pleasure. interesting. Um, I wanted to ask you, how do you think the current economic conditions, especially the lack of confidence in the banking system, um, has affected the development of Metro Bank? Do you think that it has made it harder to attract new customers? Or, on the other hand, has it made it easier to attract customers who maybe have lost faith in the traditional banking system? That's a great question. I mean, there's several bits that I'll try and give you a very short answer. Firstly, because interest rates are so low, um, I think we found it easy to persuade people to switch. Because if you're getting a really, really bad service from one of the high street banks <coughs> and you're getting no interest, why wouldn't you consider switching to another bank? <coughs> What makes it hard, because the yield curve is very flat, that's the long-term shape of interest rates projected out, is very, very flat. Banks need a, a steeper yield curve to make money. Uh, about, um, about a third of the Metro Bank stores currently break even at the store level. And by the middle of next year, the bank as a whole will be breaking even, and that's at the point in which it'll IPO, because it'll need more capital. Uh, to extend. <coughs> so I think it's, uh, we've seen a seismic shift in people's attitudes. People used to say, I don't like my bank, but I trust them to look after my money. And now people are saying, I don't even trust banks to look after my money. So there has been a real cultural shift in the last four or five years. Okay, can we thank Anthony again for his time today? Thank you very much.